So it's my great pleasure to introduce Niall Adams, who's Professor of Statistics at Imperial College in London, uh, where he's head of the, the statistics section in the mathematics department. Since 2011, he's been doing a lot of work on intrusion detection, on particularly on Windows networks. And so this is very relevant and important research for, uh, for us. So looking forward to hearing what you have to okay. say on your algorithms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for organizing this for me. And thanks to Josh for helping that happen. So thanks for coming. I know there's a, a more interesting event going on. So I feel grateful. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the good set of jokes, not the bad set for you. Uh, normally, when I t t speak at academic outlets, I have to set up all the cyber thing. But that seems a bit silly with you, so I'm not going to do all the context and cyber's a problem and it costs this much money and blah, blah, you know that. So none of that, uh, you know that better than me anyway. What I'm going to talk about is the, how I play around with cyber data and what I'm interested in is developing methodology. I'm not interested in developing solutions at the scale that you do. And the reason I'm not interested in that is because it requires large, highly talented engineering teams, which I don't have. So I'm just thinking about methodology. I'm going to talk a little bit about streaming data analysts, data and analytic methods. Uh, Josh has heard this before, so that'll teach him to come. Um, and then a, a, di a different way to bring labeling in to the problem. An obvious way, but I think that it's some, it has some mileage. Uh, that's the generic list of collaborators and funders that one is always required to have. Um, so cybersecurity actually does have commonalities with other large complex problems. So uh, the fact that you have entities, computers say, which you can record data about, you have interactions between the computers, communications, which you can record data about. This, it, this happens in many other sorts of industry. Cyber has its particular challenges, but it's a good general test case for modern problems. The game I want to play, I want to think not about trying to enhance existing defenses, signature-based defense methods, which are perfectly good, but they work well. Okay, there's always scope to improve them. I, so I'm seeking to complement existing methods with anomaly detection. And by anomaly detection, I'm really just talking about, can I construct a method that will say an entity has changed with respect to its past in a surprising way? And I'm going to have surprise defined statistically. These are, so immediately I've stepped back from find the bad guy. An anomaly is just an unusual event. It is not the bad guy. That's why I'm saying these are complementary ways of thinking. Uh, of course, what I want to do is construct anomalies for things that are known to be suspicious or indicative of unusual activity. And I'll give you some examples of what I've been led by cyber analysts, government cyber analysts, of, to be important things. Now, you, from what I understand, you have terrific data, uh, except there's rather a lot of it, but you have a very rich collection. I, I, I sort of traverse a world where the, these, these are the sort of data I can get access to in my institution, and these are the sort of accesses you can usually get in an enterprise. So mostly my remarks are phrased within enterprise. And I know you're thinking bigger than that. Uh, we'll probably talk quite a lot about NetFlow. Uh, Host-based events, what's it called now? Well, so these are the ETWs from the you know, Windows security logs. Security okay. logs on the host. Yeah. So this seems to be in the industry becoming a, a, a new place to have startups. I think your, the Microsoft view is rather different because you can engineer into the kernel. I'm only saying that because he just told me. Um, this is the sort of stuff we can routinely get. Of course, there are um, privacy issues associated with this kind of data. NetFlow is deemed personal data. Okay, so I wouldn't even be able to share Imperial NetFlow. 
because of GDPR. Now, you, again, okay, this is stuff mostly I think is bleeding obvious. Data is often enormous. Yours is going to be bigger than mine, so to speak. Uh, it's coming very fast. Even Imperial College, 40,000 people. We, we see sort of 20, 30,000 net flow events per second, which is reasonably burdensome. Uh, heterogeneity occurs in lots of ways. Two apparently similar computers can behave very differently. Temporal variation, the future is different to the past. There's a latent variable that I think is v highly relevant to cybersecurity, but v rather hard to reason out. Uh, if we think about NetFlow, a computer will be interacting with the network, whether the human's doing anything or not. And yet there's a latent variable. An interesting thing to do is try and work out how to count how many users are on a computer from NetFlow. So you'd have a latent variable model where that number is to be determined. Why might that be interesting? Well, if you predict that there's normally going to be two and suddenly there's five, that might worry you. Weak indicator. Uh, timeliness, no good to spend a year running an algorithm to say last year you were hacked. So that's always an issue. Now, in my, my experience is going to be a bit different to yours here. Uh, there's a, not much labeling. I, I don't really do much supervised learning because we don't particularly have good labels. I can collect NetFlow, but the institution doesn't run signatures against it. Now, I've worked for, in government situations where signatures are run against NetFlow and you get a label. But the interesting thing is the meaning of the label is uh, uh, different to the meaning of the data in some way. And so that I, I have concerns. And so much of what I'm going to talk about is trying to not use signatures. But if you have them, <laughs> of course, you should use them. Uh, as I say, it might be different f for you. And there's my disclaimer. Uh, it takes a large and talented team like you. Okay, that's that's called being sycophantic. Um, but it's true. Now I, I tend to think either I'm trying to do things sequentially and adaptively, which I call streaming methods, or batch batch data where you'll allow an algorithm to run back and pass over it. There's no right or wrong here. You, bias variance, trade-offs, as always. Uh, it depends on the character of the problem. But either way, you, we get all sorts of mathematical and computational problems. One thing we've often wondered, what's the right level to think about? So if we're thinking net flow, that induces a graph. In fact, it induces a timestamp graph. Uh, we can think about some subgraphs and subcomponents. We can think about sessions, and by session I mean a, a user session, which is some higher level structure than NetFlow events. Or we could perhaps dream about analyzing packets, although the scale people operate at is unrealistic. And of course then, because I haven't updated my slides, sorry, we'd have the what's going on on the device, the WLS. Now, the the Bayesian statistician in me would say, no, that's not a problem. And it's strange that he talks to himself, right? Uh, well, just write down a giant model, a giant joint probability model for all of that and integrate out any of the parameters you don't care about. And you can do that with any sort of trick Monte Carlo you like. And, and there you are. Uh, people are smiling, so I th I'm asserting that's agreement and not disgust. Um, it's impossible with the scale of the data to, to even fantasize about that. Okay? That, that would be a nice thing to be able to do, but specifying the model is impossible. Estimating it is impossible. <coughs> Updating it is impossible. So uh, this is the, my sort of pitch, which I, it, how I think about an enterprise like Imperial or how an institution like the NSA might operate. In, in this picture of levels of analytics, I'm imagining we might construct analytics for different parts of this, and then they're going to produce outputs. 
anomaly scores, presence events, whatever you like, and we're going to combine them. Okay, so that then puts us, starts, starts to put us in the world of data fusion in a certain sense, combining p values, classical sort of statistical problem, not clear how to combine p values with presence events. And then, so ultimately, my objective is to reduce this mass of data that I can acquire, and it's just automatically and opportunistically collected. It's not to do with security, it's just data they have anyway. Uh, to, uh, the ultimate objective for me is to reduce that down to a manageable set of data or summaries of data that I could deliver to an analyst who will then be able to make decisions. And of course, in such a system, the analyst should be able to feed back to the system so it learns about the analyst's interests. That is very difficult. I worked for a few years with GCHQ trying to convince them to do that. The engineering of that is very, very difficult for reasons I didn't understand. Uh, now, in this, in this human-in-the-loop security model, a, a human in the end decides, and if this was government sort of cyber, uh, the way it works in the UK is actionable intelligence needs to generate a report. A human has to sign that report. It can't be machine generated. Um, a human has to take responsibility for it because it could be used for an FX operation, for example. So that much of my thinking maybe comes from there. But even at Imperial, if a network analyst is going to come and rebuild a computer, you know, that's still a human decision in the end. Now, in this network analyst focused view, we've still got to think of this. I, I always like to put Latin in to show you that I watch Star Trek, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, who watches The Watchmen? Um, of course, those people need special monitoring, right? Ed Snowden gave us clues about that. So I'm not going to touch on that except to uh, uh, caveat the point. Uh, have you seen this picture? Okay. So the, the colleague at Los Alamos is this gentleman. I like showing this because it's an example of anomaly detection of a very cleverly designed statistical procedure supported by very cleverly designed computational infrastructure that was able to operate to, that was designed to try and find unusual uh, lateral traversal activity. And this is the only published example I know, and I mean in the open literature, of a foreign state attack being discovered and reported. This was a completely unsupervised analytic. The human insight in the construction of the analytic is that attackers in traversal will behave in a specific kind of way, and that is unusual with respect to normal behavior. Okay, and, and it's the definition and computation of the statistical summaries. This is a great piece of work. Uh, and a great picture. I'll let, uh, if you have questions about this, he can answer them. Yeah, I'm uh, that's why I did it. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, right. I'm very interested in change point detection. So imagine a process moves along. It, it's, it's being generated by an, an IID process. At some point, the, the mean changes, the variance changes, the distribution changes, and I want to detect when that happens. Uh, and that's a very classical sort of problem in statistics with a long history. Uh, I'm going to reduce everything down to a sequence of vectors, and I'm going to treat them as discrete time, such as x1, x2. I'm not going to think about inter-arrival times. Uh, this is just because the methodology I'm going to introduce requires that. Uh, these could be vectors, of course, to turn whatever you take off the wire into a vector requires a large amount of streaming effort. Let's suppose that can be done. Stream processing infrastructures are popular. I'm not going to address that. I bet there's more expertise in this room than I could possibly bring together. One thing I would say about streaming analysis compared to the 
historical roots of change point detection is the stream will continue. We're looking to find changes in it. We can't go in and stop it. Uh, just a bit of, bit of context. For the next 10 minutes, I'm not going to talk about a specific cyber example. And I hope that doesn't drive you mad with annoyance. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk about general cases. But to set this up, I'm going to maybe think about NetFlow again. So Imperial has that many computers. Th these numbers are a bit old now, but that's the sort of scale. We know very well that there isn't a sort of smoking gun behavior in NetFlow that would indicate malicious behavior. Uh, particular interest in idiosyncrasies of Imperial. What does the institution, the company, I think is a better word, what does it care about? It really cares about illegal transfer of copyright material. Why? It's worried about being sued. Uh, very few constraints on network usage in contrast to a bank. Uh, for example, we have halls of residence. That is indeed paperwork. That, that is deemed as the student's home and they are allowed to use the internet for any home purpose. And the paperwork actually refers to pleasure, and I interpret that to mean playing computer games. But it could be other things. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so, so it's a bit wild westy because of what can be done. And you've also got a bunch of security researchers testing things out to see what will happen. Uh, our major compromise route, as probably most such institutions, is spear phishing. Now, okay, change point detection. You, you must be familiar with these sorts of control charts. You're monitoring the quantity of interest. Uh, uh, you're able to define control limits. When, when the quantity of interest moves out of the control limits, you're able to define uh, an out of control event, and we'd call that a change point. This goes back to Schuert in the 1930s, 1920s. Very well studied, and what I'm going to talk about a bit is how one might adapt this. So to make it, co to give you a concrete example, let's suppose I just want to monitor for every edge in the network. I, I want to be monitoring the sequence of the number of bytes <coughs> in the NetFlow record. Let's make sure everybody knows what an edge is. Okay, so a NetFlow record is a source and destination IP, source and destination port. It's a coherent record of uh, an IP flow between two computers. It also summarizes the number of packets, the number of bytes, and a few other things about the handshake that happened. So I'm going to monitor computer A to computer B for all A and B. Uh, and, and you can just imagine I'm thinking about the mean. I'm going to monitor the mean number, the, the mean size of payload measured in bytes for NetFlow events. That isn't particularly a, a good thing to look at, but it's just to give you an example. It, could, it needn't be computers, it needn't be edges, it could be something on a computer. But the, the, method, the point is, if you can define some quantity you want to track its average behavior of, that's the machinery we're talking about. Uh, so I think I said most of this guff. Uh, now the theory, the theory, the textbook stuff, is really well worked for this. Under strong assumptions, this problem is completely understood. But the assumptions are so strong, it means you're never really practically doing the problem. Um, uh, the other thing about the theory is it was designed for de detecting a single change. And this comes from the manufacturing roots of quality control. You know, you've got a machine making light bulbs, say, and things are starting to fail. The machine is warmed up, you detect that, you now turn the machine off, let it cool down to turn it on again. Okay, so that's what I mean by an intervention. What, what we can't have in the streaming world is a human intervening like that. Uh, but mo the, sadly, most of the theory is concerned with a single change point. Uh, practically, practically, you've got a real problem of the difference between an outlier and a change point. So, if this is discrete time, 
you, you imagine the, the process generating the data. Okay, so the mean is that, and we're looking to f find a departure, so a, a new process. Okay, well, the f if I'm doing this sequentially, right, the first time I see something that departs the control limits, that could be an outlier. Okay, so what people practically do is use what are called run rules, and they say, well, you need to have three of these or five, and there's a, a sort of weak probabilistic argument you can say about how many of those you need. Okay. I, and so I'm going to talk about very simple stuff. And again, it's all apologies with me. The simple stuff is what has the prospects of working at the sorts of scales we're worried about here. So QSUM uh, is probably the classic textbook method. Uh, how, uh, Shirai of Roberts procedures uh, are sometimes called fastest detection procedures. Those are designed in such a way to maximize the speed of detection rather than the false positive rate. Uh, exponentially weighted moving averages are a sort of modification of QSUM in a certain way. That is the book's claim it are designed to detect smaller changes. The size of the change in the theory is important. Uh, you know, the size of the change is going from a mean at that level to a mean at this level. Now, amazingly, this, I'll show you the formula for a QSUM in a second. QSUM has optimality properties, many op optimality properties. But what you need to assume to satisfy this is you need to know the pre and post change distribution. So what everything about this and then everything about this process, right? Oh, and you need to know the change size, which is, of course, everything. If you know that, of course, you know everything anyway, and so you, it, it should be straightforward to see. Uh, okay, there's the formula. I don't want to get into the details of this much. Uh, uh, this is the sequential update formula for QSUM. And what I want to draw your attention to primarily is Mu1 is the pre-change mean, okay? So that's assumed known. What you do practically is estimate it in a burning period. And we, we do a detection, we, we flag SJ if this holds. So sigma1, that's a standard deviation of, of the in-control process. H, well, what's H? That's a good question. While well, we're on the subject, what's this K? Okay, those are put in there. K first. K, K is to do with the size. You can mathematically tune K if you know the size of the change you're looking for to get quickest detection properties. This is just like, this is a reformulation of the, the confidence coefficient of a confidence interval. The control limits are, are technically a prediction interval, but it's just a... It's just the control, the, the confidence level. Of course, we have to choose that always. But how do you choose it? And how do you choose that? Doing this on the stream, where I'm just going to leave this running on my data forever, and I don't want a human to have to go in and tinker with it, and, well, now probably I should have K at 3.2. How can a user know that? So it's, it's, though it's escaping from some of that that I'm interested in. Uh, the classical sort of textbook thing, there's two, two aspects of a single change point detector that you can measure, and these are the same as the, they, or these are analogous to what the two different errors you can get from a hypothesis test. Uh, you either get a false alarm, or we, you, you can say, how long did it take to detect something? Both of these are important, and in fact, they trade off against the other. I can pull, pull the false, false alarm, alarm rate down arbitrarily, but I'll never detect anything, so this will go up and up. There are some practical issues about how you determine how to control that, but let's not worry about that for now. On the stream, more is going on. I need the detector to flag a change. That'll get passed to another analytic. Data keeps coming. I, I, I'll, I'll, need to re, I'll need to burn in again, learn about the data again, then start detecting throw a detection and proceed that way. 
Uh, to keep up with the data I have, and I can't even imagine how much data you have, but what we need is constant memory, constant compute algorithms to do this sort of thing. Uh, the other thing I'm interested in is handling temporal variation. If, if the process is moving, I want to be able to capture that, and so I'm going to bring in an extra parameter. But I'm bringing that in here because it's going to make me re remove one of those other parameters. I, I'm not, of course, I'm not claiming that streaming procedures are as good as batch. I'm not using the data as hard. But if I've got to keep up with the data, I've got to keep up with the data. So continuous monitoring is then change detection when you're going to do it forever. The analytic is going to run against a stream that's infinite. And in that case, there's no sense of an expected change size. We can't know in advance how big that would be. And there's going to be repeated changes forever. OK. Some of this is less interesting. So. OK. Here's the, uh, you know they, they, this phrase, one trick pony. Here's my one trick. Right? Uh, I'm interested in estimation, so I'm going to split out change detection from estimation. If you look at the QSUM formula I showed you, that is change detection and estimation mashed together. Right? In fact, what it, if you rewrite the maths, what it's doing is saying construct a confidence interval and then do the detection. But it's been reformulated that way for whatever reason. But there's an estimation component in there. So I just borrowed this idea from adaptive filter theory called, uh, of using a forgetting factor. All this is going to attempt to do is put more weight on current data than past data. Uh, so, no, we won't do it that way. Uh, so let's just think of something simple. So XT is my sequence of feature vectors. OK. These are the recursive formula to estimate the mean vector and the covariance matrix sequentially. What this means is, if I have 100 data points and I run through this, after 100 data points, I'll have the same estimates as if I did the batch estimate of the mean and variance, the 1 over n times the sum and the sum of squares. OK? So very simple. Now, of course, that's not a very good thing to do if the world is like this, right? Because if, if, I, if I'm doing the 1 over n averaging, then at some point here, I'm averaging the current regime with the previous regime. I want to wash that out. The obvious way to do that is with a window, which will wash it out. But then I've got a set of window size. This might get us out of trouble and just ignore the bit later where there's a parameter that I waffle about. Okay. Uh, so if the, if the process is dynamic in any way, simple averaging is biased. If, of course, if we knew the precise dynamics, then we'd go and look at a particle filter. But I think it's hard to think about the pre precise dynamics of the sorts of processes that we see in NetFlow, because it's driven by whatever the computer's doing, whatever the user's doing. I think it's, it'd be very hard to write down a physical dynamic model. Now, OK, so these are, the, these are those same equations reformulated with the forgetting factor. The, the key difference compared to the previous OK, so M for mass, this is, this is the running cumulative sum. All we're doing now, instead of just adding XT in that way, what we're doing is down-weighting the old bit. So lambda is going to be a parameter between 0 and 1. We'll come back to how we choose lambda. All this is doing is putting weight, it's, it's controlling the amount of weight in the summation between the new point and all the old points. And works similarly for the covariance matrix. Now, wh why? It, this is elegant, if not sophisticated. It's elegant because it's a, a sort of smooth window, right? And uh, th this 
Whereas Gaussian data, what you're doing is, is sort of tracking the sufficient statistic. Uh, so we can get hold of estimates like this. And, and those will adapt, and I'll show you some pictures of that. But this is cheap, cheap to do, provided I can guess lambda. Just a couple of other things. NT, this quantity NT is, is called the effective sample size. It's a measure of the size of the window that's being used. It's a crude measure. If lambda was 1 here, that's the 1 over n averaging. And it, for fixed lambda less than 1, the effective sample size converges to that. But of course, I made this big song and dance about trying to escape from parameters, and I've just introduced another one. So let's see if I can make that go away a bit. Well, we could fix it. Or we could think of methods to allow it to vary. And so this is, a, again, an idea from... <laughs> Adaptive control. So uh, uh, we'll, each iteration will do one step of gradient descent in the direction of a cost function defined for the problem with respect to lambda. So that's a very standard thing. Pe people use this, this sort of argument, stochastic gradient descent out argument, all the time in optimizing neural networks, for example. I, I'm slightly abusing. Uh, that sort of thinking, but I can write down, as long as I write this down, this error function down in such a way that it's differentiable, I can, I can write down a formal der derivative with respect to lambda. And happily, if we're talking about mean vectors and covariance matrices, we can work out, we can evaluate the covariance matrix and its inverse without having to do order p cubed computations at each step. It's all p squared, you can't escape from that, but a rank one update every time will do the job. Uh, now, if we've written down a likelihood for our data, then that will imply the cost function. And it can be shown, my, this is my PhD student from a few years ago's thesis, uh, uh, an incredibly, incredibly intricate 50 pages of tedious algebra, he shows that this framework that I've just described exists in closed form for all members of the exponential family. And why? Because they all have sufficient statistics. Now, of course, well, I haven't really got rid of a parameter, have I? I've just substituted another one for it. So, careful implementation is needed. We nearly always operate with a, bra a lower bracket. Don't want that quantity to get too low from practical experience. Uh, for, for estimating the mean, we can go a bit further. And we've shown that uh, if we have IID sequence data with these properties, then the expected value of the derivative of the particular likelihood is always of the order of the variance. And that suggests... A but we don't know what the scale of the derivative is, so it's really hard to think about alpha, the learning rate, right? So if we, but we know typically the magnitude of it. So if we modify that, if we if we divide out the typical magnitude of that derivative, at least we can think about the same scale. So this is the procedure we like to use. It only works in cases which have that sort of structure. <laughs> And ultimately, all of this is, is now an attempt to balance old and new data. Why do I care about it for change detection? You know very well false positives happen. You know very well that you miss things. Okay, if this change isn't very big, right, the detector may miss it. Well, if I'm doing adaptive estimation like this, the estimator will still move to the new regime. So I still have an up-to-date estimate. Okay, so part of my interest in this is to have a way of keeping up with the world when I could miss uh, a change. Because if I see a change, I'm going to restart. I'm going to reburn it. Okay, just to give this a bit of context or an example, 
There is some data simulated. Uh, change point at 50, change in the mean of magnitude one. That is one instance of the adaptive forgetting factor. Yes, it, the stochastic gradient descent does induce oscillation. It can't be escaped from. This is the Monte Carlo equivalent of this, where we've simulated a load of these and looked at what the forgetting factor does on average. And that's what it does. And that's kind of pretty. It's doing what we want, right? The change happens. The forgetting factor says, oh, no, the world doesn't look how it did. And then it burns back out. Uh, the sad part is we can't make this go much faster. We can't make it recover much faster than that. So basically, the lambda there is it's saying forget everything, yes. isn't it? Yeah. It's saying I want to be small because the past is no longer relevant. Yeah, precisely. Uh, just comments about scale. So those are three different choices using my scale and heuristic. Uh, okay, so the, the, the shape looks as you'd expect, you know, uh, the smaller the learning rate is, the slower the thing can move, okay, but these are orders of magnitude different, and we're getting pretty similar results. So it may not be too critical. So let's say I've not completely convinced you, but there's some reason to be hopeful that the choice of that parameter isn't as critical as the choice of a window parameter, a sliding window parameter. Uh, hmm. So I, I'll, I'll come back, back to that if you want. Uh, it turns out the thing that I've just described sounds completely heuristic, and it kind of is, but you can put it in correspondence to a Kalman filter. And that's kind of fun because it gives it some more formal justification. I'll come back and do that if, if you want. Anyway, so where, where have we got to? I've now got an estimator that will track a moving target, and I don't really have to put many parameters in to do it. That's not giving me a change detector, because what I need is a prediction interval associated with the estimator. Now, how can we do that? Well, the, uh, the, the, the popular in machine learning at the moment is to use concentration bounds. OK, uh, so we can always write down such a bound. Our experiments with that said it was too wide, which the interval was too big. Okay? Uh, and I didn't want to spend forever trying to tighten that bound. Okay? The next thing to do, the, the, the roguish statistical thing to do is say the whole change detection literature is based on Gaussians, so let's talk about Gaussians, and then everything drops out quite nicely. And the thing we're working on now is estimating that distribution directly using, using non-parametric streaming methods. One way is based on, I'm going to choose some quantiles to monitor, and at any point I'll have some representation of the empirical cumulative distribution function via that, or to actually directly estimate the CDF. And we've got some ways of doing that. I'm going to, for this, I'm just going to do the strong parametric stuff, because the mass drops out. But the, the, these will be the answer. Uh, if we do let everything be Gaussian and we make assumptions about what, how the estimator would behave if lambda was fixed, everything drops out beautifully. Okay. Um, and from there, we would be able to define this prediction interval, the confidence limits. Of course, alpha, that's the co confidence coefficient, if you like. That's, that's the control limit. How many times do you want to get it wrong? Uh, now, we can only extend that this approximately to the time-varying forgetting factor. The time-varying forgetting factor induces correlation because we've used the data to set it. Okay, so imagine now I just want to have this analytic running forever and just come to peace with the fact for now the data is going to be Gaussian. Okay. Uh, we're going to see blocks of data coming that are di identically distributed. Then at some point it changes, it changes again. It's going to do that forever. Uh, don't need any of that. If we're going to do it not just once, but we're going to let the detector run and run, then the traditional performance measures aren't enough. Something that Josh has been telling me about the last couple of days, I think we, the cyber community, need to think 
harder about how to correctly measure performance for some of these problems. I think there are subtleties that cyber brings that mean using off-the-shelf performance measures may miss something. I'll do another example. Anyway, so there are some more things you can d define which are sort of obvious. Did you miss one? Is it a false detection and so on? These are actually things I use in epidemiological surveillance. Details don't matter. Now I can do a massive Monte Carlo simulation. If you're a stats audience, I'd really let you have it now. Uh, this is pretty boring. This is how I set up a simulator. But you, you, people are perfectly capable to imagine I'm going to simulate a bunch of stuff like this. Right? Uh, and then I'm going to measure some things. Details don't matter. Uh, the only thing that's worth pointing to is uh, in the simulator, there's a certain period where a change won't happen after another change. We prevent a change point happening one tick after a change point because that would be an impossible thing to do. You, you know, if the world is changing like that, you're not really talking about change detection anyway. So that we have some, some constraints and we have... An, when we do a detection based on a confidence level, we allow a burning period for the change detector to relearn. Again, details of that not too critical. That's how some of those things are defined. I mean, if, if you really wanted a, a boring hour of reading, details are in there. Uh, what did we test against? Now, here's the thing, you know, I was waffling on about wanting to reduce the burden of control parameters. If you go to a textbook like Sheldon Ross, Introduction to Probability, look at the chapter on QSUM. Great book, not criticizing him. He gives a table, right? He gives a table. The parameters for QSUM, if you want to detect a small change, are this. And he's got some way of defining a small change. And for a moderate size change, are this. And for a larger than moderate size change. And so, what are we meant to do? I don't know what what to use here. So what we did was just choose a bunch of textbook recommendations and ran them all. Okay? See if there was a set that always works well. You know, you know what the answer's going to be. Uh, ditto with humour. Okay? It turns out, actually, for those of you who care about these things, the forgetting framework I've described is, is in a specific sense, a limit case of humour. Um, uh, adaptive estimation with fixed forgetting, so we'll just run it over a bunch of constant lambda to see what happens. It's a simulation. The time varying approach, okay? So I have to do, I have to do set the learn, I have to set the learning rate, yeah, but maybe that's not too critical. Test level, at least I understand what this test level means. It's kind of the false positive level, right? Whereas I don't know anything about it, what H and K mean. I can reformulate them, but just taking it from the book. And then JSA, don't know what that is, can't remember. Uh, when this went off to a reviewer, they said, your method isn't complicated enough. It, you should use something with more parameters. But we said we didn't want to do that. So we did it. You know, uh, And that had four more parameters. Because it had uh, a component for seasonality and an outlier controller and, and all sorts of other things. To that point, I mean, there, there's a lot of phenomena where I effectively expect the distribution to be changing. Like, you know, for NetFlow data, there's going to be a diurnal variation 3 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. like one-tenth of, there's going to be a weekly variation, there's going to be a seasonal variation, and then there's going to be the whole thing is just network traffic is increasing as a function of time. I mean, how, how do you... I mean, right. Okay. So, I've actually got some stuff later which will start to address that, but what I think... Uh, the way we handle that is absolutely, it depends what we're measuring, right? So the example I gave was the number of bytes, and that might not show diurnal seasonality. But if I'm just talking about the number of events, say, then certainly in, in Imperial NetFlow, that follows the working day, and it flattens at the weekend. And there are weekly ones, and in fact, we know Wednesday afternoons are less. And the way to do that is to learn from the population and then correct these estimators. So I can now write a convex combination of the estimator for the computer with the estimator for the population. And that will capture population effects. But you're absolutely right. Not, not using that is just disastrous. It would seem to me that NetFlow is like the worst data set to, to, to try this on. Because there are many things where, like if you look at, say, credit card fraud, you know, if you're 
if you're, um, if the number of failed transactions at a gas station goes up, I mean, this, the, you know, this has a, the, 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 the average number of this in the, in the legitimate population should be more or less fixed and, yeah. not, and not changing as a function of overall transaction volume. So any change in your mean is actionably bad, whereas yeah. It seems to me here you've got yeah. so many. Uh, well, I, I'm impressed that you can <laughs> no, anything out of Netflow. You're absolutely right. Um, Netflow, it, Netflow was designed for accounting, uh, and and I'm sure if we were redesigning it for security things, it would have a rather different. Uh, the cut the fields would be different, uh, but we use Netflow because we can get it. You know, you, you as the designers of a operating system have access to things no one else does. Uh, but the way we would handle that is to mitigate out those population effects by learning. So I can equally le well learn the population version of the, com the individual computer version, and I can optimally combine them. Now, the question of whether it's an optimally, optimally combined estimate or it's an optimally combined change detector long tail, right? So when oh. the changes in the mean of something that's very long tail aren't as meaningful as changes in something that I, you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, it kind of depends on what the thing we're measuring is. Uh, the bytes example was bad, and, and it's nice that you're calling me out. And if you look at, if you look at a, a random computer, most of its number of bytes will be tiny. And then now and again, it's massive because they've just downloaded a movie. But if I can learn about the fact that it's a mixture distribution, I can still make progress. But I'll come back to another aspect of the timing thing. But generally, the way we would do it is to use the population to remove those known or learnable seasonalities. OK, there's a boring table. Uh, it doesn't matter except, first of all, I don't expect you to read this. Because I haven't explained it at all, right? Uh, truly the act of a charlatan. I might as well have tweeted this. Uh, oh, steady. Um, uh, all of these things subtly describe the performance of these detectors. And they interact. You'd have to look, spend some time looking at re really what the numbers mean. Apart from the fact that pretty much always JSA, the one with all the parameters, is rubbish always for all parameter settings, even when we tried to optimize, cheat and optimize them. Okay, the only thing is, our proposal is based on that, and those numbers all look about the same. So, QSUM can do great, it can do terrible, if I've just got one set of parameters. Yuma can do great, or it can do terrible. The method I'm proposing does okay. Always. In all, this isn't the only simulation we did, okay? Uh, and that, the real interest for the streaming analytics part is to have something that will run without intervention, without having to be concerned with fine-tuning of parameters. <clears throat> okay, so. Okay, here's a real example. This is a bit more. So imagine I can go to NetFlow, and I'm going to call this node B. That's a specific IP address. And all the traffic into it, I'm going to just call A. I'm not distinguishing where it came from. It's just traffic coming in. And all the traffic going out is just going to C. It's not, but I'm just matching it all up. So there's uh, timestamps coming in and timestamps going out. Right? So I can measure the distance, the, the, I can measure the temporal distance between an in, incoming event and an outgoing event. Right? And I can, think of the dist I can think about that as a quantity that I can measure the average of. Okay, why well, might I be interested in that, relay? Relay often manifests as something happened at t here and then at t plus epsilon here. Okay, uh, so I'm taking some of that methodology that I just described. Now I'm talking about a time difference. Strictly positive, because it's one before the other. Uh, and it takes, you have to slightly contrive that. And what I'm interested in is the minimum. I'm not talk, thinking about the mean now. I want to know if this is unusually small, which might be more indicative of relay, because the relay software on here will respond faster than a human. 
Yeah, to give a, a little context, I mean, for, for those of us who uh, don't think about cyber every day, if we see machines that are forwarding data, that's all they do. That's pretty concerning. Most of the time we would expect that a computer would talk to another computer directly, and if there's something intermediate, that can be very concerning. Tunneling is one way to describe it. Go ahead. Okay. So, slightly adapt. It, it turns out there is well-formed mathematics for IID data when we want to reason about the distribution of the minimum or the maximum. And, and that, that work becomes extreme value theory in the end. Uh, so adapting some ideas from there so we can use extreme value arguments for the distribution of the minimum. Okay. Those are, those are some lags. Just This is just a demo. I'm not claiming much here. Uh, uh, there's your upper confidence bound. The red lines are where it crossed. The methodology will bend, right? What we want is methodology that will bend. So you, I want to go after something different. How do we bend it? OK, now, now, you know, another thing about one trick ponies, right? So here's the trick yet again. But I'm not going to re regurgitate it all. So the example I started with was a continuous quantity, deliberately, right? But lots of cyber things are discrete. Server ports, IP addresses themselves. OK, so now I've got a. Uh, a sequence of discrete states. So, well, I can think about a sequence of discrete states. I can think of that as a realization of a multinomial distribution. And I, my problem then is to estimate cell probabilities. Uh, well, I'm going to think about all that, those boring recurs recursive equations. I'm just going to recycle that into estimating a multinomial. The only extra trickery you need is that you need to Re, re weight in such a way that the sum is one. And there's, there's actually a sort of dem demonstrably right way to do that. The details are not particularly relevant. Uh, so it's mostly trivial extension. But this again means now we can be tracking a changing multinomial. Again, it's nice with, with respect to the learning rate because the cell probabilities are bounded. I'm going to very quickly now, because I know we're running. Quickly, two. These are more recent things, so more summary. Uh, if I can think about a multinomial, then I can think about transition matrix. OK, because that's just it. that the rows of a multinomial are transition matrices, and you can treat them independently. And I'm just going to think about the idea of tracking a multinomial. So server port sequence, I'll do an example of that, and I'll come back to this one. In either case, the question is, well, I can estimate these cell probabilities. How do I calibrate the magnitude of the change? Which means I need to think about the uncertainty in the estimator. Uh, so let's talk about transition matrices first. So I'm just thinking about, think, think back to when you learned about Markov chains. So uh, the, the present is conditionally independent of the past except the last value, and you can think about the transition matrix that represents those probabilities. Okay, so that's an object I want to track. I want to do change detection on. Well, it's interesting because it's a complicated object. How, how, how do you decide what, to, what the target of detection is? So there's at least three obvious ways. The first way is element wise. I've got a dis I can think about the, the distribution of every element in the matrix. Or I can think about row-wise, each multinomial. Or I can think about matrix-wise, the whole structure of the matrix and matrix theory. Uh, and it turns out these get harder as you go down that list. And in fact, you'd also see a trade-off between false positives and detection speed as you go down the list. Uh, for now, I'm just going to talk about one. Uh, so estimate PIJ in exactly the way I was just describing with the streaming forgetting factor. OK, that, well, it's a binomial quantity, so I get the variance for free from the mean and the effective sample size. OK, bit distasteful, but I'm now just going to fit a symmetric confidence interval because the distribution of that quantity is in general unknown. 
So th this will be good enough, hopefully. Uh, and big simulations, I could show you at another boring table, but I won't. Same sort of thing. It, it works. But actually, there isn't much you can compare this with. There is no equivalent detector. The only thing we, you, we could find was use a standard Bernoulli change detector on every element. So, uh, but this reduces the burden of parameter setting, which is what I'm looking for. But the other interesting thing about the transition matrix is that it gives you a chance to reason about expiry in an indirect way. So everything about things changing over time, it might be that some states we saw last year we don't see anymore. We need to expire them out, right? Otherwise, if we're just building a, a list of who, which computers we've visited, in the end, it's the whole internet. Mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't be any use. So the transition matrix gives us a nice way to think about expiry, and it's the columns. Right? If the column of a, tra of a transition matrix, if its sum starts to look like zero, no one ever visits it. Okay, and, and we've got a nice little bit of probabilistic trickery to determine an appropriate threshold for that. So it's nice for the indirect expiry. And it might be that in a cyber application, seeing things expiring is as interesting to an analyst as seeing new things. That's a claim, more than anything else. Uh, so here's a toy example. This is not a real cyber example. I was doing some work for a company and I happened to have some data. So it's a request to a scheduler of a server farm, 440 requests per second. It's not much, but that's what I had. Uh, for various reasons, they were interested in the type field of, of a HTTP request. In the data we had, we observed these six, six types. 96% of them were GET requests, which is probably unsurprising. Uh, this picture, don't worry about this too much of this business. This is time. It crosses our, our detector, our transition matrix detector. The squares are WBS. That means wild binary segmentation, which, which shows that statisticians can be artistic with their name as well. Uh, but it's not flying method. And this is our attempt to tune it, so we were happy. I mean, the problem, as you know very well, you, you really don't know the truth, right? This is real data. So the best I can do is throw some very fancy method and hundreds of hours of compute time and compare how they do. So there's some, I think there's some mileage in that. I often think about sequences. We might be looking at a router, looking at the sequence of traffic going through it. If we see a sudden spike in the transition structure, that might be surprising. Might be interesting. Uh, supervised lose, learning, supervised losing, story of my life. Uh, all these things, all that forgetting factor stuff extends kind of straightforwardly to linear classifiers. Kind of straightforwardly. Uh, more difficult with nonlinear methods, and it, it's the complexity control that's the problem. We have actually adapted all of that to work with single layer, multi-layer perceptrons, but you have to fix the number of hidden nodes. Can't tune that at the same time. There's an interesting deeper problem here that we haven't resolved yet. So, so what I'm claiming is you, you could run an MLP sequentially and adaptively. But there are interesting issues about the relationship between model complexity. So a linear model it, it has no complexity, <laughs> it's just a linear model. Uh, if the distributions, if the decision boundary suddenly changes markedly, does that mean the complexity necessarily should reduce? There's some things we haven't worked out about that. And the other, the other thing about supervised streaming classification, which I think the literature doesn't do justice to, is delayed labels. Nearly always in the academic stuff, they've invented a cottage industry of you get X, you predict Y, you are now presented Y, and then repeat. And that's true on, for, only for cases where the thing you're predicting is about the next tick. Is the value of this going up or down, right? But in credit, we talked about credit card fraud. You find out a month later, right? How do you incorporate a delayed late? Very hard. Uh, okay, future, I couldn't think of a name for this. I wanted to talk a bit about uh, labeling. Because I can't get labels for cyber, I'm going to invent some because I want the, the machine learning 
the supervised learning machinery where I can get it. So instead of having a label given to me, I still want to do anomaly detection. So what I'm going to do is to say, the label for whatever it is I'm measuring, and now I'm going to bin time up. Forget streaming, we're binning time up. And of course, there's choices about bins, bin sizes. The label for the current tick will be something about the next bin. So the example I'm going to do in a few minutes is, is not written on there. Haha, <laughs> good preparation. Uh, OK. So. Just spontaneous get myself out of trouble then. So I've been time up. OK. Uh, th this is going to have a feature vector xt, which we'll construct. And there's going to be a label yt plus 1. I'm going to try and predict that from this in a machine learning, or it's a supervised learning way. And this is going to open the door to data fusion for me. Why, why do I want to do that? Because I can get the machinery of machine learning, of supervised learning. Of course, this might be impossibly cumbersome to implement in a production system, but that's not my, that's, I can't do anything like that. Yeah. Uh, and it'll give me, well, I'll use this to start to talk about combination and fusion. So here is, here are four plots of the amount of NetFlow events, that's the response that I'm going to use in five minute bins over a certain period. Now that, that you see, it's funny when I have to teach classes to undergraduates, we never show them data like this. Right? The data always looks nice. This looks horrible. Okay, look, so I mean, that's probably uh, collection failure, or the machine was switched off and you can't distinguish those things. Uh, this and that, well, there are two different processes operating there, and that could be a collection artifact, or it could be the fact that there are two people using the computer. And burstiness, burstiness, you know, this goes between zero and 4,000 in rapid bursts. Not easy things to model. Now, what I'm going to try and do is predict this quantity from a feature vector constructed in the previous bin, just with NetFlow at the moment. And I'm going to try, because I want to do anomaly detection, I'm going to try and construct a prediction interval for that. Remember, it's a continuous quantity here. Well, there's a count, but we'll treat it as continuous. OK, so then I can do anomaly detection against my prediction. And this, this will work for many sorts of things. So we, again, you are the experts at really understanding the data and being able to craft good features, so we just made some up. OK? And these are the sort of things, things to do with time, uh, counts of events and properties of events, uh, backets and byte loads, things about ports and protocols. So for a bin, for a computer, we're able to generate, generate 35 features just from NetFlow. And that's not using, that's the level zero feature. It's not using anything about the neighbors it's interacted with in the graph. You might call them level one. Okay. The, the one can decorate these very greatly, but just as proof of concept. Oh, and what do you do with an empty bin? Well, we just mark them out with a missing value indicator. Uh, there's better things one could do. Uh, more, yeah, anyway. There's the list of things that I could do and didn't. Uh, what did we try? Well, we saw that lots of zeros, so it, and it's a count that we're looking at, so Poisson models, zero inflated Poisson models, and then borrow some of the machinery of machine learning, random forest, quantile regression, so just add linear regression works on the conditional mean. It's possible to work on conditional quantiles. Computation isn't that much greater. Okay, and then quantile random forests, which do exactly what random forests do, but they do it conditionally on quantiles. Uh, so for this problem, we needed a benchmark, and the obvious benchmark is use the, the data itself, the true yt predicts yt plus one. That's quite hard to beat, and we're throwing quite a lot of machinery at this. Uh, we only did a few devices, but there are also issues about the correct measure of forecasting performance. 
It turned out that for sensible sorts of measures, the random forests and quantile forests kind of were the best. Uh, but prediction isn't enough. Right? I really want to be able to capture uncertainty here. So that's why we're interested in QRF, because we can construct a prediction interval directly from QRF. Remember, we're, we're making the prediction indirect because it's the future. And so the prediction interval would be for the future. Now, that is QRF on one of those examples. The left-hand plot is just the prediction. Now, interestingly, the QRF has managed to capture the fact there are two processes, whereas any sort of direct mean estimation wouldn't because the mean is in the middle. And this, I don't know if you can see, but there's this sort of very pale pink. So that's the QRF prediction interval evaluated at each point. And that's doing pretty well. In fact, it it, empirically, it's conservative. It doesn't have the right coverage, but it's in the direction of being conservative. So what this is kind of in indicating, and there was a learning, there was a, about a day's worth of learning done before. This is the prediction data. This is the out-sample data. Uh, that's not throwing many flags, which I think is a desirable thing. OK, I'm nearly there now, so... It's been a long journey for all of us, but we're nearly done. OK, data fusion. I'm going to use that idea now and think about data fusion. And this is very poor man's data fusion. Uh, I'm not talking about engineering data fusion you'd think about with Kalman filters. I'm talking about two different sets of data that I'm going to mash together. So Los Alamos released a nice set of data, a second nice set of data, and it's a bunch of WLS stuff and a bunch of NetFlow. And it's, they did a very good job of trying to anonymize it and also trying to explain it and clean it, which was greatly appreciated by we consumers. So I'm going to think about the same problem now, right? the same sort of I'm going to define a response variable. And it's going to be a response variable of interest. And what we have been told is network analysts think, no, think novelty is interesting. So how about if the definition of a response variable is now going to be binary, and it's going to be, has this computer made a NetFlow connection with a computer it hasn't visited before? OK. And then, well, I've got two. So I'm defining the response variable in terms of one data set, but I've got two data sets. OK, so WLS is massive, and you guys have expertise that I lack. We just generated some simple features from WLS in five-minute bins, or ten-minute bins, can't remember, and a bunch of simple features from NetFlow. And we like the simple features mostly because they're quick. To, they require little effort to compute. I'm not claiming <laughs> this isn't the right set. This is the set that a PhD student could do in a week. Right? Um, now... OK, so remember, the response is about network activity. The red line is based only on the features constructed from NetFlow, and it's using a random forest. Well, you know, NetFlow, I'm using NetFlow to predict NetFlow. The blue line is only a WLS data. And you saw how crude the W... These are the things we were describing a bin with. Right? There's nothing in there particularly indicative of the desire to create a new edge. Okay? Now, I know your problems are always microscopically down at this end, but it seems, it seems to me that's pretty good performance for such a crude thing. But WLS features that aren't really powerful, or you wouldn't expect them to have such power, are doing something quite useful there. You know, I think, I, I think anything in, in the 20% range is of interest at least to us you know we're not going to look at 80 percent false positive probably <laughs> but something less than 20 is so even there we get we're getting the 60 percent number okay so then data fusion okay and again i don't mean the sort of formal engineering uh what what he's described here as is early and late fusion so what we and this is a phrase we've borrowed from bioinformatics 
And by early fusion, I just mean I'm going to mash the two feature vectors together into one big feature vector. And by late fusion, I'm going to build a tree for each separately, and then I'm going to risk average their result. OK, so if you do that, what we see is the early fusion is the best, which means that the, feature, the features are interacting. OK, so slight, slight, input, uh, slight performance boost. Incidentally, uh, something to be very careful of, if you're in very highly imbalanced problems, binary problems, where one class is minute compared to the other, you get all sorts of problems from the likelihood. Uh, Arto in wrote a paper in 2008, and he showed that in some limit, all you end up doing is using the mean vector of the minority class, which is very dangerous. You're not using any, any information, right? If there's cluster structure in there, it's last. Uh, if you ha I think we've got to come to a more detailed analysis of deeply imbalanced problems. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, just for fun, so this is the early fusion. So just mash the two feature vectors together, feed it through a random forest. Random forest produces an importance vector, which is some measure of how much each variable is used in terms of how much likelihood it contributes to its leaves. Uh, so just run that through a clustering algorithm after normalization. Obviously, there are two clusters of computers in there. Right. First, so what do those clusters look like? That's a parallel coordinates plot. So the difference is primarily something about one, one group are more sensitive to time than the other. Though, those may be single user machines, we haven't looked. And maybe a little bit of difference here. That would be great if you were finding servers and laptops. That would be great. I'd be so happy with that. So, so this raises, data fusion is one thing, data aggregation is another. Right? For, for the, what? Pictures brackets not shown also show that you could, for this group, if you mash them together and deal with them as a single entity, you get even better performance. But by mixing those with those, they're sort of, whatever they're capturing is different. So, so one can think about fusing data and then one can think about aggregating individuals. Uh, okay. Now, I completely cheated you there and because and, and I've been droning on, you didn't pick me up. The question is, how did I compute those ROC curves? Right. And how I computed them was, well, I've got a bunch of test data. I've got a bunch of predictions on the test data. Probabilities, here's my score. Well, it turns out if you actually do it within computer and then aggregate those, you get a different answer. When we talk about population aggregation, so you're doing something that is of the individual, but then you aggregate over the population. There's a right, there's a, a way that can be concealing. I've shown you the good results. If I showed you the results the other way, it wouldn't look so strong. It's still not terrible, but not as, not as good as that. Okay, I think we need to think in cyber world about when we're doing ag aggregation across populations, what the right performance measure is. Now, there's always the beat the boss performance measure, but I mean the genuinely useful stuff. Okay. Uh, ah, well, okay, I touched on this earlier. I need to expire my list. Okay. I can't just have a growing list of computers that I've connected to, and, but we have a tool for expiry, so we can learn to do that as well. Can think about surprise, which predictions are wrong. Okay, we could re recalibrate these using these prediction interval ideas as well. How does the output of this process relate to the structure of the graph? A, a new connection is something that might be associated with lateral movement. If we see in the graph space, see paths of new connections, that might be very interesting to be able to pick out. And of course, we can do this to anything. I, again, I'm not trying to solve specific problems here. New, we know that port scoring is valuable. We know from intelligence community, port scoring is valuable. Okay, same sort of thing. Exactly the same sort of argument. New IP server port pair. Do the same thing on users, right? It could be, we could be defining the response variable from the WLS, which has how many users and which users. All of those things are things we can model 
And what we're going to do is combine those outputs in useful ways. Because recall, I don't want to have an automatic system in the end. I want the system to reduce data to give to analysts. Uh, fine, okay, this is, I promise this is the last 50 slides now. Um, we, I, we have a multinomial change detector. I'm not showing you the maths because there's one step that I can't fully justify. But essentially, we, look, we estimate the streaming multinomial using the machinery I defined. And then by reasoning about the callback Liebler divergence between two different versions of that estimator we were able, and, and bounding that quantity, we're able to threshold a score okay, to do change detection. Here's some simulations that shows this, this, this vertical axis is the quantity we're measuring for change detection. So, and, and this is the A control limit. Uh, this, then this is that run. <coughs> this is one day of imperial net flow for one router. Different choices of alert level. These are where we saw the alerts. OK. You, you, some, you have to set an alert level. Experience tells you which one you want. So I'm imagining a dashboard where a user could sort of click and get the view they like. Now, the, the reason I'm raising this multinomial detection is there's no reason I couldn't be running that as part of the feature vector. I might want an estimate of the th three most popular ports or three least popular ports for this computer for this bin, and I might want a moving estimate. Okay, that is information that might be valuable. I think the other interesting thing, so just to go back in, you know, it's all everything's about non-linear here, so I've gone backwards. Um, It'd be really interesting to see if NetFlow can predict a new user, right? Uh, we haven't done it, but I'd be very curious about that. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we... we For the other one, where yeah. an existing user creates a new... Uh, yeah. The, the, the yeah. user data tells us these two computers talk. Yeah. So there's always to configure that, but yeah, no, you know, okay. I, so I, I don't try and deliver cyber solutions like you guys do. Uh, you need really brilliant access to data, which you have. You need teams of experts, expert analysts, expert engineers, which you have. Okay. Uh, but it's a great place for me to play around with methods and then be able to interact with you to explore how we might do some things together. Attackers aren't going to go away, and that's kind of good to keep us all in business. Uh, I'm not trying to develop full solutions, but more interested in talking with people to see which, if any, of this stuff is relevant to them. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so, actually, I'm only clicking back to the slides so, as I think about my answer. But, <laughs> and you can see now that I can't think of the answer, and so I'll start going slow. Uh, right. Um, so, what this was to demonstrate was that there's a correspondence between the key Kalman filter update equation. And, and the update equations I use. Uh, and that meant I can reinterpret the forgetting factor. And it turns out to be something related to the signal to noise ratio, the ratio of those guys. No, we didn't try Kalman filters on this because we didn't want to specify these things. And we didn't want to learn them. Well, I can, I can estimate that as I go, for sure, but it's not going to be fixed. The Kalman filter wouldn't be right for this because it's very unlikely that these are fixed quantities. These aren't indexed by T, right? This is the most basic Kalman filter. Any Kalman filter where this is time indexed, you need to know it, or you need to do a particle filter because you're now into nonlinear estimation of that. So it's 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 not gonna gonna work if you if you try to use Kalman filter, right? Because it's, of this. Because uh, well, 
you couldn't use the you wouldn't use this because you wouldn't want to make this assumption. I mean, what I'm showing here is that in some unrealistically simple mathematical formulation, the procedure I'm using has a correspondence to it. But you wouldn't, you would, this wouldn't be an appropriate model because of the assumption that these aren't time varying, and yet the data certainly is. And the moment I allow those to time vary and I don't know them, I have to estimate them, I can't do that with the Kalman filter. For example, variances of things in the middle of the day are typically higher than at night yeah. because there's more activity and the variance is proportional to the mean in, in many cases. Uh, I had to throw back to, to his question. Um, like just, just to make sure I understand properly, if, if you do have sort of a bunch of different, maybe known seasonalities in, in a time series data set, is, is the right way to approach your method to fit like a traditional time series model to it, estimate those seasonalities and then use your, like set a learning rate and use your adaptive forgetting like uh, factor on the residuals of? Uh, well, well, okay, that's a good question. In fact, it's two different good questions. Uh, let me think how I want to avoid them. <laughs> uh, uh, so, if you have the resource, I would nearly always be wanting to do time series analysis right. with seasonal components and trend. Right. But what I've been describing here is sequential, right? And, and you can't you often do very adaptive trend and seasonality modification streaming. So, that, in answer to the gentleman's question, I, it's still, I would actually be learning from the population to mitigate population effects as a way of trying to get time series behaviour into the model because I'm only doing it sequentially. But if, if, if the problem isn't so demanding that I have time to fit a proper time right. series model, I'll much prefer to do that. This, I'm thinking of examples where I'm going to get to see this data, it's going to run past me and I'm done. I'm not going to ever look at it again, right? So I can't do any um, uh, non-linear optimization here. But otherwise, yes. So we, what what I'm doing is trading much statistical power for compute speed right. and and fixed memory, right? We don't necessarily, depending on what sort of time series model we fit, we don't even have a guarantee of how long it will take to compute. Right, my the, the, these things. When I'm talking about the streaming parts, the other things are a bit different. Uh, I'm specifically worried about. I get this much time to do an update. But otherwise, of course, time series. We do time series. So, just uh, I mean, your question made me kind of think of it again. But it seems to me that there's a big difference between. Um, the kind of problems where I can really reason about the underlying what expected distribution. Like suppose, I mean, you, you, you did a good job trying to sidestep it at the start saying anomaly not equal to, to necessarily bad. But like, l let's assume that we do assume that the anomaly is coming from bad stuff. If we did a thought experiment and just say, let's say all the bad guys in the, in the world took the week off. And then we could look at the actual, true, clean, pristine distribution. You know, So if, if I can reason about that and I can understand how, how that would be stationary or, or extract any non-stationarities or periodicities in it, yeah. then it seems like I, I, I can really reason about how the changes you're detecting really make yeah. a difference. The problem is when, when I have an underlying distribution where even if all the bad guys you know, took the week off, I still don't understand you know, how, to, how to reason about it. Then, it, then it's very, I, I think it might be kind of useful to, like even if I can't estimate the clean distribution or don't have a hope of estimating it, but I can still reason about it knowing that it's kind of stationary and I'm, I, 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 anything else is kind of positive excursions away from it or yeah, good yeah. or bad in some sense. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and hopefully, even if we say the bad guys didn't take a week off, their amount of activity is going to be swamped out and so we could still detect seasonal effects for the most part. If, if they're having such profound effect that they're changing the seasonal behavior of an enterprise. Right, it's probably not zero mean, but if it's uncorrelated yeah. with the, the good stuff, yeah, you, maybe you can estimate something. Yeah, so then, then we would seasonalize it out for sure. So on your next brief near the end, you had the plot that was circular addition to dividends. Oh, yeah. uh, were any of those turn out to be interesting? <laughs> Uh, your uh, university network? 
the fun game we play with the university network team is they provide us the data. When we go back and say something happened here and it was yesterday, they don't care. Right? The, the, the way they, there's only three of them, right? Manning a network for 40,000 people. Uh, uh, they have a specific way of responding to things. This, they wouldn't. The, the thing about this, those cyber analysts is we'd not just need to say something here has changed. We'd need what and why and how's that to do with anything. And we can say what, in this case, actually, this port has, has in any mathematical sense, it, the, its probability has changed. Now, uh, and we can tell them which port, right? Uh, and then they might say, so what? And, and the answer I would say now is, well, if you'd have been doing this when WannaCry hit Western Europe, you might have seen that. Uh, but in general, they, their job, they don't have time for monitoring. So they would just say, very interesting. You know, I think, I think there's some, uh, there's, a, there's a variety in the market in terms of what people want. And I think some of them want this um, in uncontextualized form, where it's, this was weird. And banks like to do that kind of thing. The SMB market, which unfortunately I think is just a reflection of funding for academic institutions and cybersecurity, but <laughs> they only have three guys and they just own it. So they're sort of equivalent to the SMB market and, and there they, they have to just have very high quality. You better do something about this now and here's why, you know, sort of answer. Yeah. So I, so I think some of the, this was weird, we don't know why, is actually desired by a sector, a segment of the market. It's the high end of, this, of, the, of the market. Just to um, the gentleman who read the questions about population effects. So the interesting thing is if you look at these red dots, maybe it's interesting. Well, the nice thing about cyber data is you can do just so tales. You know, just, it could be this, right? It's like evolutionary psychology. You can tell any story you like. Once a caveman did this. Uh, uh, Seven o'clock in the morning is a suspiciously interesting time. I could imagine that's when they fire off updates and things. Uh, 9.30? Well, academics never get in to work before 9 o'clock, do they? Right. 3 o'clock, okay, people are starting to bunk off, go home. Yeah. Yeah. Updates again. What we would do as we monitor this, we would learn about where those happen. And of course, a thing that you have the capability to do, which we really don't, is go and, go and get a straight direct answer on, when do you send your updates out? You know, they might know. If we had a, a timing of regular things they do that affect the network, that might eliminate half of this. If we don't have that, we have to learn it. But again, outside, because you have the contained environment where you have data, you should be able to find this stuff out. But it's not always easy. No. And even the net, only one of the three network guys will know the answer. And there's no standardized system across different customers for how to track these things. And we're trying to do things at scale across many, many enterprises, right? And so it's probably unlikely that we would have yeah. the particulars of a given organization as well. But then we would we'd be trying to learn. Right? Yeah. Well, we're over time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again. Sorry. Yeah.